Welcome to another edition of Geopolitics and Empire. Quick reminder, support the broadcast. Your support is crucial to keep me going, to keep me on the airwaves. And the best way to do, it by, to do that is by becoming a paid subscriber on the Geopolitics and Empire Substack, a little over $9 a month or a little over $90 a year. You can also become a founding member. We do private weekly Zoom group chats with uh, members only to shoot the breeze on current events. I do a weekly write-up of the, the week's news, which uh, has become very popular with supporters. And I bring back sometimes past podcast guests to do a live Q&A with paid subscribers only. You can also donate through DonorBox Wise, buy me a coffee and so forth. You can also purchase a consultation if you wanna chat with me about expatriation, geopolitics, whatever you like, and check out my affiliates, easydns.com, Legal Shield, escape the technocracy. If you use the code geopolitics, you get 15% off. There's a great course by Gabriel Custodiat, a past guest of mine, Wise Wolf Gold for gold, and uh, check out Above Phone for a de-googled phone, and do leave a podcast review on Apple, Spotify, and Elsewhere, returning to the transmission is scientist and entrepreneur Jobst Langrebe. He's been in AI since 1998. He's a guest professor, head of technology of a biotech company. He's co-author of the fantastic book, which we discussed previously, Why Machines Will Never Rule the World, Artificial Intelligence Without Fear. Welcome back to Geopolitics and Empire, Jobst. Hi, Arroyo. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Glad to be here again. Good to have you on. I love the work that you do. Uh, by the way, congratulations. I think you told me that uh, your book will now enter its second edition. Is that correct? Yes, I have to submit the final manuscript in three weeks. So I'm on the final adjustments. We wrote several new chapters and I think it's it has got gotten even better. And it's a great honor and, and also success to have a second edition on such a complicated monograph as, as this is. Yeah, I, I highly recommend the book. And if, for people who haven't purchased it yet, maybe wait for the second edition to yes, be published sure. and, and get that. Uh, you can get it on, on Kindle or, or physical copy. I've got uh, mine. And you're a great contrast uh, to myself, Jobs, sometimes because I, I bang on about this dystopian technocracy that's that's coming after us. Yet you argue that it's not really going to be possible. So there's some good news there. Uh, and so we got a, we got a, a host of topics that we, we could get into, you know, the algorithm ghetto, the cashless society, these smart 15 minute cities. So where would you like to start? I would, first of all, I'm not here to blue pill anyone, right? So uh, I, I don't want to say that we are not facing problems, but I would like to analyze them from a sober perspective of looking at historical similar developments and also at what I think is is a fundamental structure of human society. So first of all, why is are we facing all of this? So Nietzsche said at the end of the 19th century, and Ortega y Gasset also repeated it uh, some decades later, that modern societies uh, which have solved the problem of famine, so where everybody can eat enough, uh, and at the same time don't have creed anymore, where there is no God anymore, that it becomes very hard in such control societies to control the people. So usually every modern society that we have since 5,000 years, so I mean with modern society, society based on urbanization. So where you have a town or a city where, where people do, do not know everybody anymore, where there's anonymity. From this point on, you, you cannot have like a village community anymore, but you have a society, which is what Max Weber describes really well, you know, uh, in, in, in his works. And, and when you have a society, then you need institutions and you need, of course, centralized power. And so I'm not an anarchist. I don't believe that societies can exist without centralized power to, of some, to some extent, at least. And then you have to ask yourself, why do people submit themselves to this power? Why do they follow the powerful? Why do they actually do what the rulers are asking them? And and this question, there are many, many answers to this question, but the most fundamental one is if they have something to be afraid of and the rulers promise them that they will alleviate this fear. And there was a time in Western society in the 60s uh, and also 50s after World War II with a booming reconstruction economy uh, and a huge degree of participation of everybody. So and, and where, you know, simple workers could afford a car and a refrigerator and vacations and, and also their voting behavior was taken into account in the political decision making. And at that time, they were following um, the, the order because they were really enjoying the way the order was presented to them. But, but this is often exceptional. And many times, there's not such a high level of participation. And, and then if people are not afraid of anything, why do they follow the rule? 
This is a big question for those who hold power. And I think that now we are in a time globally where the degree of participation is dropping. So both economic and political participation are dropping. And in such times, either you increase the participation again, which is what Roosevelt started to do with the New Deal and which became successful after World War II, or you don't increase the level of participation and then you have to have repression. And repression works by making people afraid of something and then they, they can follow the state and I think and, 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 and obey. And I think this is what we're witnessing now globally. It started first in China, of course, um, where we had this already uh, uh, since the communist revolution and it got refined there a lot. And now the patterns that were developed in China are also coming to the West. And I think this is all the topics you are discussing in this podcast have to do with this, I would say at least the Northern Hemisphere, uh, is now getting engulfed by this new type of rule. And and we can discuss the various components, but I think that's where this is coming from. And and now we have to ask ourselves, to what extent can it work? Yeah, th th that is the big question. And, you know, I, I give off examples. I'm here in Mexico and just in the past couple of weeks, mainstream Mexican papers announced that they will, you know, Mexico City is 25 million or so people I haven't checked the latest numbers. And mainstream Mexican papers said, we're going to begin to divide the city into multiple 15 minute cities, right? Smart cities, resilient cities. I had a guest on from Australia, how she detailed in Australia, the government is openly discussing this and, you know, beginning the deployment of this project. Now, how that will be borne out, is another question, but you know, my, my, I'm just pointing out. Well, look, this is they're they're saying they're doing it, and they're going to try to attempt to do it. What that will look like, anyone it's is anyone's guess, but uh, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, your thoughts. So I think that that if you look at a uh, uh, highly um, civilized society of the past, like the Greek polis, you know, Athens, Sparta but also Rome and, and all these antiquity powers of the antiquity, which were highly civilized and differentiated societies. If you look at them, they had slavery. So slavery is the strongest form of repression that exists because the slave doesn't own himself anymore. The slave is an object owned by somebody else. And this somebody can decide not only what the slave is supposed to do, how the slave is supposed to live, but also kill the slave with impunity. Right. So slavery is the toughest form of suppression. Now, even in the worst times of, of, of these slaveholder societies, never were there more than 25 to 30 percent slaves. So there's a natural limitation to how many people of a society can be held as slaves. Because if you enslave too many, there's resistance because there, there's no hope anymore to escape slavery. And so basically slavery can also only work if the slaves are terrified of being killed if they're rebel, but also if they have kind of a hope of getting out of slavery, which was always a recipe of slaveholders that they offered, you know, if you reach age 50, you become free or you can make savings and buy yourself out of slavery. There were always, you know, uh, some hope for the slave to, to lose the status of being a slave. And, and if there's, if you enslave too many, then they, there's no hope anymore. And then people will, will rebel. So, so I think there's an upper threshold to the percentage of people that you can truly enslave. Now, if you think of 15 minutes, minute cities or what you call the algorithm ghetto, which is, which is in the end a world in which, um, Everything you do is tracked, recorded, and can be replayed and observed and analyzed. Um, if you think of such a world and then of this idea to link the recordings of your behavior to your ability to purchase goods, for example, right? This is this looks this is what some people call digital slavery. Now, I believe if you uh, roll this out and try to make it watertight, there are two reasons it will fail. First of all, if it would be function, which we'll get back to in a minute, it it would alienate so many people if you if you roll it out to a too big uh, proportion of the population that people would try to escape from it. So I think it would meet natural resistance because it's an it's not um biologically possible, I think really biologically possible to to hold as slaves a too big proportion of society. So that's the first reason I think it won't it won't become as terrible as it is, for example, imagined in 1984 by George Orwell. The second reason is 
Um, and that's more, even more important is I think that's a system that would be needed to, to make such a surveillance state where you record everything that everyone does and then um, attribute to the individuals their their possibilities to purchase good, to move in society, to meet other people based on their behavior is technically unfeasible. And the reason is that to do this, you have to interpret what people do when they when they use their smartphones. You have to understand what they write. You have to understand what they say. You have to understand um, conversations um, between several parties, and you have to un you contextualize the actions people take. And 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 um, uh, for example, if I say um, I use one of the forbidden words like the, the N-word, right? And say, using the N-word is bad, then I use the N-word in quotes. And then I'm basically not saying anything bad. But for a software, it may not be possible to distinguish this. And then it, I may still be framed as having used the N-word illegally or in a way that is now not, not now punished. And what I'm trying to do is a simple example is say that it is for machines impossible to automatically interpret what humans do. Not only what they say, but also how they behave, how they move, why they buy what, what they do, when, where, and so on. It's very hard to interpret, even for human beings, it's hard to interpret the actions of another human being, but let alone for machines. And so, because when you start recording what everyone does everywhere, you, amount, you get a lot of data and basically you cannot manually go through this data. You can do this for a tiny proportion of the population that you have singled out as dissidents, like the Stasi did in Eastern Germany, right? So, so there, I would say maybe half a percent of the population were, were singled out. And then there was another 5% of the population, 10 times as many, who were direct or indirect collaborators of the Stasi with the sole task of watching those 0.5%. So you see, it's it's very laborious, and if you don't have automation, you simply cannot do it for a lot of people. Or, or can we use the example of you know AI, the, you know it's called artificial intelligence. Sometimes I think it's it's uh, I, it can be better defined as like it's not artificial. It's it's almost like automated in, in intelligence. Or if we take a platform like YouTube, um, and they run the AI. The automated Stasi, let's say. So the Stasi yes, is now yes, automated yes, and they yes. run it on the YouTube platform and it detects the key words. And sometimes it, it's too aggressive, right? It gives off false positives. It'll it'll um, take down people's videos or channels um, sometimes that shouldn't be taken down. And so some the powers that be seem to err on the side of um, caution for themselves uh, or, you know, and, and so... If you take it, if you look at it platform by platform, so, you know, it, it seems to be working pretty well, the AI on YouTube. And then what if they apply that to credit card purchases, you know, you, you, if, if your, your, your bank app and, and, and so forth, what success do you mm -hmm. see there? So, so I don't think it works well on YouTube. What it does is that it's using keywords, right? And now I can, I can talk about any topic that is now uh, categorized as misinformation, disinformation, or hate speech without using any of the keywords and the AI will not detect me, right? So for example, I could say, um, that the combination of nucleic acids that was used for, for means of primary prevention against respiratory um, uh, a disease uh, was um, uh, did not um, follow the full set of procedures that are normally prescribed by the regulators, right? I can say this, and the AI will not be able to spot this. I can, I can do this for anything I wish, and I can always choose a different wording because the AI cannot interpret what I'm saying. It, you know, so the examples you, that you mentioned are, of course, only working because the, the speakers are not yet fully used to this new environment. So, so the the AI will miss a lot of create a lot of false negatives once people get used to it. And if I look, listen to many podcasts, they already start doing it. They already start to use language that circumvents the filters. On the other hand, it will create many, many false positives, right? So when I say the N-word to say that I, it shouldn't be used already, it will create a false positive because it just looks at the usage of the N-word. And, and so, and there are many other examples. And, and so therefore, the tool is much too blunt 
to really work at the detailed level of understanding human communication, which you need if you want to start really systematically revoking basic rights, like the right to move freely, the right to buy anything, the contractual freedom. And if you want to remove these very, very basic freedoms that, that predate Uh, um, that predate democracy by many centuries, right? These are very old classical human rights that have been present, natural rights that have been present in many societies and the revocation of which has always been seen as problematic, the full rev revocation of which means that you are a slave. And so I think if you want to start revoking, if I mean, to, to, make, it, to make it acceptable to society that you remove the, the, the possibility to buy certain objects or to, to, to book a certain flight, you have to have a narrative that is very convincing. And so, and so I think it is very, very hard to tell such narratives to the society, um, given that the, given the differentiation of human behavior. So therefore, because human interactions are so extremely complicated, they are complex systems. It's not possible to define a set of rules that convincingly manage this. Now, if you are targeting a minority, like the Nazis were targeting the Jews, or the, the Bolsheviks were targeting the Mensheviks, these are small groups. If you're just targeting a small group, you can do the, the scapegoat trick, right? You can, you can burden everything on this small minority. Even like Stalin showed, you can actually select every three to four year another minority, load everything on this one and destroy this minority and then go to the next one. But basically... If you want to target, if you want to rule, it's not sufficient to target minorities. Then you have to have uh, uh, two thirds or more of the population totally agreeing to everything you do. And for this, you need a narrative that that is that is convincing. And I don't think that that the algorithm, what you call the algorithm ghetto, is is can can do this if you want to target the masses. If you just want to target a few, you know, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, also, um, that's possible, but as a mass phenomenon, it, it won't work because, but, yes. But my question then becomes: well, What you said there is interesting, and it's it's fascinating that you that you point out that you need buy-in by two yes. thirds of the population. More. What if two thirds of the you know if it's brave new world where they sell this new form of tyranny as? you know, something convenient that brings pleasure, mm -hmm. right? And in, in some ways, this whole digital ghetto to many people is is nice. You know, it's the whole Netflix, mm -hmm. with the whole Uber Eats, you know, mm -hmm. system. Everything has become in, inverted. But what if two-thirds of the population, and you talk to a lot of people in many countries, and they mm -hmm. see nothing wrong with this, you know? Like when I was the, during the, the uh, corona thing, Uh, I was talking to some of my students out in Kazakhstan. I was still teaching virtually and they had to use an app to do anything. And I asked them, like, are you, does that seem normal to you? Are you okay with that? And they were like, yeah, it's fine. It's no yeah. problem. And so what happens though, yeah. uh, if two thirds of the people buy into this, because it's been sold to them, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, these digital mm -hmm. currencies are more convenient. Oh, using these apps for all this stuff, it's more convenient. The surveillance, it's, it's uh, you know, more secure. What, could it go that way, you think? Yeah, so 1984 is interesting in many respects. And two aspects I would like to highlight before, uh, sorry, Brave New, Brave New World. So first of all, in Brave New World, you have the gammas, deltas, and epsilons. All of them are genetically modified human beings, which are devoid of a lot of intellectual and personal capabilities. So the epsilons are characterized as being totally almost inhuman, but also the gammas and deltas have lost many of the aspects of what it means to be human being. All of them, the, all the three uh, layers are enslaved and they accept it. And I think they accept it because they have been genetically modified. Of course, in a way that is not realistic and not possible, but it's still interesting. Second of all, even though they have been genetically modified, they all are addicted to Zoma, which is a psychoactive substance that makes them, you know, Uh, uh, accept everything that makes them feel ha chemically happy and accepting everything. And only with the genetic modification plus the drug, which they constantly take and for which they are actually willing to kill. There's one scene where somebody takes, tries to take away the Zoma of a group of Epsilons. He's almost being killed. Um, uh, I think, I think uh, uh, this shows you to what extent you, how radical it is 
Uh, and only the alphas and betas who are very privileged in this society, they basically, they go to the movies, these uh, uh, 4D movies where you can also smell things, you know, and they are basically, they correspond to the group that you were characterizing, but they are only the minority. And they, they are not, you know, uh, uh, so, so much uh, changed as the uh, gammas, deltas, and epsilons. So what I'm trying to say is that in this dystopia, even there, uh, what is the, the, the amount of effort that has to be taken to make the population docile is very, very big. And I think that the whole Netflix, Uber Eats convenience world, you know, order everything from the phone. Uh, um, if you don't want to, uh, if you want to exercise, you go to the gym, but you don't go outside anymore. And you're totally in this half digital world, like in Ready Player One. Basically, it's a great movie to show how this would be, you know. Uh, and and um, I think people will only accept this if if they feel no threat. But if more and more people feel feel threatened, then it will it will there will not 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 be any buy-in anymore. But if you have to suppress uh, quite a big um, proportion of the population over longer periods, then uh, the level of anxiety rises also with those which who have bought in. And then the le level of legitimacy drops. And this you can see in any society that has been in this, what um, Guillermo Ferrero, a total genius, has described as spiral of mutual anxiety. So the state creates oppression. The people are now afraid of the state, but now also the state is afraid of the people because they become aggressive under the oppression. This is what you saw in Napoleon's reign, under Stalin, Hitler, all of these tyrants, they, they were totally scared to death of the population and vice versa. And I think over time, like you could see it in Eastern Germany, already in 1953, just a couple of years after it was created, 90% of the people were totally disenchanted with communism and rejected it. So it's very hard, I think, to create an oppressive environment that people in the midterm see as positive, maybe in the short term for a short while, but very soon they will realize themselves to what extent they've become restricted and, and then they will start being afraid. So I think that psychologically, it only works for a short time, like uh, in the COVID era. It worked, but it didn't work very long. And, and, and the effort that was used to maintain it was extreme. I mean, remember how much propaganda there was. The newspapers were full of it all the time. The news were full of it. And, and then they created new variants. And, you know, and at some point you could actually, even the true believers who got triple or quadruple vaccinated, they started saying, hmm, Strange. I don't really believe in this uh, Xi variant anymore, or whatever. You know, so it's it's very very hard to maintain this state of emergency. Uh, so even both on the positive and negative side, I think it's not so easy to maintain this. And and but there's also um, a, a purely technical limitation to this. If you, and, if, yeah. yeah but just before getting to the technical yeah. um, limitation, I just I did want to ask you then, mm. since you're there, and let's say you're in the heart of the EU. The European Union, mm -hmm. which I like mm -hmm. to call sometimes the Fourth Reich or the New European Soviet, or uh, as Croatians call it, Euro Slavia. Um, what you're seeing them try uh, pass these laws or um, you know bills that are voted upon or whatnot for digital identity, digital vaccine passports within the EU. The thought crime you see in the UK, many mm -hmm. countries now are attempting to legislate thought crime, just like in 1984. Yes. So if you commit a thought, you'll get a visit by authorities, or you'll get a fine, or you'll go to jail. Some of my past podcast guests, like CJ Hopkins now in Germany, yes, uh, he just, um, he won his first court case. They overturned, lost. they overturned it. Now they found him guilty. So just a few days ago, and now his last Hail Mary is he's 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 asking for funds. I think he needs 12,000 euros at least. He's gonna go to the Constitutional yes. Court of, of Germany and I guess if he loses that, he'll decide whether he'll go to jail for a few months or pay uh, a few thousand euro fine. Yes. So wh wh what is your assessment then with, okay, I, I get what you're saying, but Brussels is still putting out all of these laws and legislation. And so what, what do you make of that, of their motivation and how that's all going to turn out? I mean, they tried to solve the Nietzsche problem, how to rule in the absence of famine and, uh, and creed. 
right? So, so they are really working on creating a centralized rule along the lines that you have described. And and what is so interesting is that when Brexit happened, I thought that England would be now freed. But actually, what happened is that the UK is now at a faster pace than the EU. It's like basically the prototyping everything for both the EU and the United States. So, and, and it's really interesting, by the way, regarding thought crime, I think you can, you still have to express what you're thinking. <laughs> so, and, and it will stay like this because there will not be machines which can read the mind, but still it's, it's opinion crime is bad enough. And I think they are rolling it out and, and I think it's, it will, it is, it will still be accepted for quite a long time. Right. So if you ask, you know, um, now the case you mentioned with Hopkins is a bit difficult because their Spiegel is, is, uh, has a swastika on its front page, you know, once a month. They never get punished and he has it on a COVID mask and gets punished. So this is a bit, you know, puzzling for the normal citizen. But, 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 but for them, this case is not made so much public. So they don't realize it. But in most cases, if you ask the average German, and this is very important, outer party member, speaking in Orwell's terms. So the 15% who leads the society. If you ask them about, and they are they are decisive, they need to back the system. If they stop backing the system, you're done, right? That's why in Orwell's fiction, uh, the state is focusing so much on them. Because, so they leave the proles alone. They can do what they want because they don't matter. It's only the outer party that matters. And and I, we are both members of the outer party, both as teachers, you know, and intellectuals. We are typical members now. We have we are deviating a bit from the mainstream narrative, but we are still, you know. And but but most of our colleagues from the outer party support the, uh, uh, um, what is going on. If you ask them nowadays about the things you are describing, they say no, it's a good thing. We need to fight the neo Nazis which are coming back. Uh, we need to defend democracy. Or oh, you know, Putin is so dangerous, and they really believe all of this. And so at the moment, all these this lawmaking is still working. It's still really in the consensus with the elites. It's at the moment working. Why is it working? Because all over the West, the life of the elites is still good. You know, they yes, they are also losing purchasing power to inflation, but but they have a big buffer. Um, many of them own second ho first and second home. They have several cars. I mean, this lifestyle is still good. They, they, are, they can, you know, do what they want. They can travel. So they, they basically, for them, it's even a relief if less people can travel because the airport is less clogged with people and so on. So basically, and they don't feel threatened because they think that the right persons are singled out for punishment, right? And so so if you would bring the, the, the case you mentioned to them, I said, yeah, but why does he have to criticize the great COVID measures that we're taking? I mean, this is also crazy. He should get a vaccine and, and be grateful for it. You know, so th this is the way they think. So the consensus machinery is working perfectly. It's in the fiction uh, theater, novels, short stories, uh, radio shows. Uh, uh, Netflix is full of it, you know. And I was watching a Netflix series with my kids. There are now only female fighters there. <laughs> and so on, you know. So it's, it's, it, it and, and my kids were asking, but, but they don't have children. They don't have families. Who has, has the children? They were saying. <laughs> one of my children said aren't the, the women too too precious to be killed at war should they have children <laughs> it just tells you how far we've gone yes. and, and you, I, I really need to go reread all of these dystopian novels my, my favorite I began with was Yevgeny Zamyatin's We which was oh. published in I think the 1920s and then it's the or first one Right, and then Orwell, He's genius. 1984. And I, I don't have a, a physical copy of Brave New World, and so I'm going to have to purchase. Uh, I think there's the updated edition, Brave New World Revisited. I'm going to have to be purchasing that along with Huxley's The Island. Um, but I was going to say uh, one more thing. Oh yeah, what, what, what you just made me think of my my very first guest. Uh, you know, Geopolitics and Empire, the podcast began in 2015, but I, I count from 2020, 2012 because I had a channel mm -hmm. called Dissident Thinker which mm -hmm. is when I began Skyping guests into my classroom. And that channel is still on YouTube linked to geopolitics and empire. People can find it. My very mm -hmm. first guest 2012 was Corporal Jesse Thorson. And he was like, he was a perfect example of the description of what you said of the, the outer party, which I guess is like the middle class where he's a military veteran, but on his messaging system on, on, on Facebook, he was sending private messages. So not public messages, but private messages through Facebook Messenger or whatever to his friends and family questioning 9-11 and things like this. And he got visited by the secret police in America. 
uh, there no warrant or anything. You know, there's video of they just come to his house. He opens the door without his shirt. You don't have a warrant. He didn't do anything wrong. They just take him in rendition. They throw him in a car and take him off to an insane asylum. And it's a perfect example of what you said, 1984, because he was someone that could have a powerful voice being a veteran, you know, speaking mm -hmm. out. And so he's watched by the the the, the big brother. L luckily, uh, he was gotten out by John Whitehead, uh, a civil liberties lawyer who I've also had on the podcast. He got yeah. him out. But I thought that was just a perfect example. And it had been my very first interview on this um, <laughs> podcast. And I guess, so you mentioned pre previously the technical limitations. Yes. You know, th that's another thing. Um, we see it everywhere, right? Australia, Canada, USA, Europe, all over Latin America. I'm reading these articles on biometric update. So you had this last week, they reported in Kuwait. If you do not now submit your, there was a deadline, I think September. Uh, if you don't, if you didn't submit your biometrics, your bank account is frozen now in Kuwait. Then I read in Bosnia, they, are, they said they are leapfrogging the technology for digital mm -hmm. ID. And, you know, many of these countries, the infrastructure is, is not fantastic. Uh, but they say all you need is, you know, internet and a mm -hmm. smartphone yes. and download the app. And then you, you're in the algorithm ghetto. And so your thoughts on the technical um, limitations of all of this. Yeah. So, so the point is, if you look at... Uh, if you, I think what is really worth reading uh, as a foundation is, uh, is, uh, is Simmel and Weber to describe how societies work and also tackle Parsons, who, who invented uh, the idea of the social system. These are the great classics of sociology that everybody should read who is in thinking about these things. And if you, if you look carefully how they describe society is that that society is ultra complicated society is ultra complicated so there are so many interactions that go on without any rules so we have always the impression that there's so much regulation legislation that everything has already put into verbal propositional form but in reality the propositional form of the rules of society covers maybe half a percent 99 0.5% of how we act is not written down anywhere. It's passed on by socialization, by families and institutions. And all this unwritten behavior is, is a lot of it is unconscious, unconscious and, and automated. And it, it, it replaces the instincts of the animals. We don't have many instincts anymore. And so we have this socialization induced behavior that, that enables us to function as social beings. And this, this behavior is super subtle and very complicated. And it, it defines the roles that we take on, every one of us takes many roles on every day, depending on the social situation. And all of them, for all of them, we have a huge and complicated repertoire of behavior that we, that we unconsciously utilize to, to perform the roles. And without this, nothing would work. And all of this, because it's not propositional, cannot be consciously monitored. So because it's not propositional, there are also no written rules. And so you cannot check the rules. So, so basically, the fabric of society works with this unconscious, unpropositional knowledge, the know-how of social entity of social beings. And this know-how of social beings, it's it's uncontrollable. And when, what happens in situations where the where the social control gets very tight, uh, this kind of um invisible fabric of society finds new ways to deal with the environment. So if you read what Popitz described, how the social society in the Concentration camps organized itself. Uh, or, um, or Primo Levi, he also describes this very well. Or if you look at uh, The Third Man, um, which is a movie by Orson Welles uh, in Vienna, right after the, at the end of World War II, after the end of World War II, it's about a uh, black market for penicillin. And how basically under the Russian, there was Russian occupation, I think, they develop a black market for penicillin and how the human interactions work and how all of this set up. Everything that is officially there, the whole layer of government control is undermined by, by, an, by an informal network and fabric of society. And you have this everywhere. You had this also in Yugoslavia at the end of the Yugoslavian Empire. Um, you had this also when the Deutschmark was illegally used as a means of payment. You must be have been very small at the time, but that was in the early 90s. No, I, I, I very much remember still in the late yes. 80s, 90s, the currency in Yugoslavia was not the the dinar, uh, was the Deutsche Mark, the, yes. you know, the yes. German Deutsche Mark. And people, yes. like, it was like how people in foreign countries talk about the dollar today. Yes. Uh, Croats, us Croats, my parents were all, and, and extended aunts, uncles, and family were all 
uh, talking marks, you know? Yes, and you see, and this is spontaneous, spontaneous evolution. And of course, the government didn't want this, but but it happened. And I believe that if uh, if the, if there is such a net of control forming, people will find ways to evade. Now, a very important example is Napoleon. When Napoleon came to power, the outer party, the middle class, but also the upper bourgeoisie and those of the nobility who had adapted to the French Revolution, like um, there were some, right, like Tayeron, for example, they basically were then following Napoleon. They were supporting him for roughly ten years. Then Napoleon started to make many mistakes, and around 1810, he lost the support of the French outer party. And what they 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 collected illegally collected money, donated it to the British to finance the war effort against France and Spain. So there was a big war campaign of Napoleon fighting the British in Spain and Portugal, which was financed by the French citizens. Also, they spied, the military officers, you know, spied and gave Napoleon plans, uh, sorry, gave Napoleonic plans to the British army across the channel so that they could know what was going on, what Napoleon was planning. So basically, Napoleon was undermined from within because he lost, he had overextended his reach, he had, he had tried to institute a power that was not adequate anymore for the outer party, and that's why he lost it. And not many people don't know this, but this is very well described by Benjamin Constant in his phenomenal book, um, uh, De l'Esprit de la Conquête et de l'Usurpation. It's one of the best political philosophy books ever written. And uh, where where he describes this, um, he was a Benjamin Constant was a total genius. Where he describes this, how basically Napoleon's overreach undermined himself, and it did did not only happen militarily in Russia, for example, but also within France. And and I think this is a pattern. So if the rule becomes too illegitimate, and the and the outer party is fed up with it, then it stops. And so if if all of this algorithm get, if they try to impose it, they, they, it will have to also uh, include the the outer party. And and the outer party won't accept it, and 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 I think I think therefore I think the struggle for for introducing this Chinese system in the West is ongoing. And right now, most of the outer party are not conscious of it, and they accept it because they they think it's convenient and so on. But once it will start to harm them, you know, they will just meet offline again. You know, take a walk in the forests where there are no microphones, not take their mobile phones with them and discuss the matters and organize. And, and this, this invisible fabric of society will start to work. And, and technology, now the technological limitation is that because this invisible fabric of society is not propositional, there are no sentences describing it. There cannot be a catalog of all of this. Because of the subtlety, you cannot put map it into a machine because in a machine you need always a function a function takes an input and based on the input create a deterministic output even a, a machine learning artificial intelligence function is trained and it's a stochastic uh, uh, algorithm but once it is trained and you deploy it it's deterministic so if you give uh, an ai the same input it will create the same output and this this deterministic procedure can only cover knowledge that is propositional or that is that has very strong patterns Like when when AlphaGo learned to play Go, there are so strong patterns in the in this closed world of Go that the machine could could pick up the patterns. But in general, this invisible fabric of society is too too subtle to model it into a machine, and so therefore you cannot the 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 tool that 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 there that is that you need to put in place to control this is much truth is doesn't have the subtlety it's much too blunt to cope with with this type of human interaction and if you understand on the one hand how subtle human interactions are and on the other hand how blunt machine learning and ai tools are then it's a kind of relief now there's still the problem that you can very eff eff effectively suppress a, a minority this is can always be done and this can also stabilize societies for a long time think of the soviet union right so the soviet union But on the other hand, um, uh, the, the, the outer party of Western society comes from a very high level of freedom and, and well-being. And the drops that are happening are quite terrifying. And so this, this removes legitimacy. So overall, I think for psychological, social and technological reasons, it's impossible to do this. Because because the models, it, it's a form of Cartesianism. Yes, that's the best way to put it. So Descartes believed that with mathematical equations, you can describe the entire world and control everything. And also Lagrange and Laplace, you know, they believed this, that you just have to write down enough differential equations that you can control everything. But in reality, 
There's a huge gap between what you can capture with mathematics and, 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 the, and the many, many shades of gray of reality. And because of this, the, the algorithm ghetto speech just built on algorithms, but the algorithms are blunt. And the reality is super complicated and the algorithms cannot cope. And, and even, you know, oh, now let you talk and then I have another argument. Yeah, I mean, so I guess to summarize then, do you think the powers that be at some point will relent and cease with implementing the algorithm ghetto or that they will continue, but it will be like um, a version light where it'll be there, but people will just easily be able to walk <clears throat> around yeah. it. So if I would be Kissinger of today, you know, a strategist of power, I would tell, I would tell, I'm not, you know, right, obviously, but if I would be like Kissinger and had been in such a position, I would tell those who execute the power because he, well, he was also executing it because he was also um, uh, uh, for a period um, minister of the exterior. How do you say in English? Secretary uh, of American, State. No? Yeah, Secretary of State. Yes. Um, uh, he was, but, but basically I would tell them that they should not overextend it, but keep the repression for the minorities. Right. So you can use this if you only want to target 0.5 to 1% of the population and from time to time, create a big example of a scapegoat that you punish in public, like they are doing it with uh, with the uh, swastika guy, um, Hobbs, Hopkins. C.J. Hopkins. Or yeah, in America, yeah. you know, Alex Jones is yes, an example. Yes. So, so basically, if you pick out from time to time somebody which you punish with great, um, you know, visibility, and and then so to speak deploy what you call the algorithm ghetto only to a minor only to minority that can work then you also have the manpower to execute it but but if you try to deploy to the entire society it will it will it will fail and so i think i think we will we don't know what's going to happen but at the moment that trying to continue and to deepen and enlarge it but at some point the limitations will become very obvious it's already to a certain extent happening you know but, and, and, Maybe just one more thing. Oh, sometimes yeah. people put in my comments in the Telegram channel or elsewhere, and it's a good point. They they sort of point out the weakness that sometimes we think the powers that be are stronger than they really are. Uh, and often people will write comments to the tune of, if, if they were that powerful, they would have already implemented many of these things and they still have not and they're struggling to. Do, do you think that's uh, any thought on that? Yeah, so so this is a very interesting question. How powerful is the power, right? And I mean, it can be extremely powerful. Think of the Stalin era, right? I mean, there were years where Stalin killed two million dissidents in one year, you know, or or minorities he wanted to get rid of. And and so I mean, even given the big Russian population or USSR population, this was a huge amount of human beings. And 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 so I think that that um, that this can alter. However, the stronger, and we don't know to what extent this is, but I think, to be honest, the, in the West, um, at the end of the COVID period, for, I believe that the reason why the, why the West did not move on the demands of Russia with regard to Ukraine was that they felt super powerful because, they, because the COVID vaccination campaign was, I think, from a perspective of power, one of the greatest power success stories uh, in the last, in the modern era, right? So to vaccinate billions of people um, in this way, given the efficacy and 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 uh, and safety of this of this family of compounds, is quite an achievement, right? If you if you see it from a very cynical power perspective, and after that they were really really drunken with their power. And that's why they then believe that, you know, we can get rid of Russia and uh, divide Russia into 10 or 15 pieces easily because they were so, it was such a big success. So I believe that currently the established power is still very strong. It's comparable to the power of the Catholic Church around 1500. No, so it's it's uh, and and um, there are weaknesses and cracks in the financial system, especially that's the weakest point, right? And you have had this Indian guy who has a few weeks ago who described it perfectly, you know. Um, and I also see I have, that was actually my point of entry to fall out of the mainstream was seeing what this Indian guy saw in two thousand seven, two thousand eight when the financial system cracked. Before that, I was a mainstream person. 
And then I became a dissident in a, in a way because of this economic thing that was happening with the financial system. Because then I saw that Hayek was right with the cycle theory and fiat system criticism and so on. And this was my entry point quite late. But, you know, I'm a scientist. I was before that totally only in science. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, and um, and so, but but I think... Um, the real weak point is the following. If you want to build such a technical surveillance system, you need to have a computer architecture, software architecture that models all of this. Now, one of the most complicated software architectures we have is a Google, Google system, email, internet search, and all the hundreds of applications that Google has created. It's quite a remarkable system, right? If you think of it, if you use a Google application, uh, Google Maps for driving, And uh, and uh, I, I I saw a traffic jam. I went around the corner. There were just 20, 20 bicycles riding as a group. All of them had their smartphone on, so it was registered as a traffic jam. It's remarkable, I think, right? And so, but but this is already getting to a limit of complexity. Although these applications are still relatively simple, it's getting already to a level limit of complexity. What can be done in such a huge global computer architecture? And if you get and to build what you call the algorithm, get you need a computer architecture is much, much, much more complex. Now I've been for a couple of years in in a corporate IT uh, design deployment projects for huge companies like Philips, Royal Philips Electronics, Novartis. Uh, that's already 15 years ago, 10, 10, 15 years ago. But I've done this uh, for a living for a while. And if you look at 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 the limitations that come just with the complexity. Or, or, or the complicatedness of setting up such computer uh, software architectures, you realize that even this, these systems, they become so complicated that they become chaotic. So that that you, though every bit of the system is deterministic by putting everything together, you lose track and it becomes chaotic and unmanageable. And this is what's happening also. If you build such an algorithm ghetto, you need an infrastructure to 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 put it on that can manage all of this. I think, given and I'm not Alex Kreiner is also saying what I'm saying. That basically we he and I, I agree on this that that the system that you need to build is from a software architecture perspective too complicated to make it really work properly. It's very vulnerable, and it will and that's more important create mistakes all the time. And if these mistakes are about restricting what you can buy or not getting your wire transfer correct, people will will become. I mean, even I mean, if you think of a typical member of the outer party who cannot buy something anymore, though he's a perfect, you know, he's voting for the right party, he's right, uh, reading the right newspapers, listening to the right radio station, and now because of a mistake of the system, he cannot he cannot book a train anymore. He will become nuts, turn nuts, you know. So I think because of this huge complexity, the system will be so error prone that it will fail. It's self-defeating and, and it will crumble and become a, get out of control. And, and if you think of it's very, very hard to make complex systems that are stable over time, a complicated systems, these are not complex systems, but complicated systems that are stable over time and, and not to lose control over their behavior. And so I think these are systems that are not engineerable and maintainable. Yeah, Alex Finner is is uh, great. He's also with you on this that he doesn't see it feasible. And just as an example, what you mentioned uh, just before we connected, I went to pay my internet service provider, and my card was rejected. And then I tried again, and it was accepted. But sometimes the bank will reject it, or I don't know, uh, reject the payment attempt. And it's just so much. Just a, a tiny example of this frustration but you you what you brought up something that i've been thinking about a lot lately is when it comes to this ai and the data centers that they they have to build out now and they're saying it's going to use so much energy electricity and water i've read that in some states like i, I read an article for the state of virginia i think like 25 of the electricity will need to go at least to the data center And this is something I've only learned in recent months to to build out at a global scale, right? In each nation, this algorithm ghetto, which is going to need the AI and the AI data centers, it's going to require an insane amount of electric energy, water, electricity, and so you, you, just your thoughts on that. It's it's yes. it seems I don't know so how they're going to do it. So this is a very crucial point. First of all, I would like to correct one thing you said. It's mainly about digitization. The AI plays only a tiny role, right? So this this what you call algorithm ghetto requires 
mainly digitization and a bit of AI, but the AI is not very effective because of what I explained a bit earlier. But now comes the crucial point. The whole green agenda of the Western elites is in contradiction, in self-contradiction with this idea of building an ESG state, right? So the ESG state is, is basically the Western version of the Chinese model. Now the ESG scheme is for companies, but there will also be an ESG scheme for private persons. And this is what corresponds to the Chinese system. And I think the attempt to build that, and it goes back to the trilateral commission, that this was already planned decades ago to do this for the West and the East, right? It's an old idea. It's a, it's a global elite consensus. And it's not a conspiracy at all. It's just, you know, what seems reasonable to solve this problem. How can we control the modern masses? That's the question they're asking themselves. And this is also the question that 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 um, people like Brzezinski openly discussed, you know. And and so, and they are clever people. I mean, they are not stupid. And they so they th thought about this for a long time. And th but this this agenda of doing this, this is basically the Bentham's Bentham's panoptico. You know, they want to build this is actually keyword that is important to mention before we end this today's conversation. It's a modern version of the idea of Bentham formulated in 1790 that you should have a, a means to control movement, perception and body of the subjects. He was thinking about the prison to control the prisoners. But basically what you are calling um, the, the algorithm ghetto or 50 minute city, hell or whatever, is basically a, a, a version of the Bentham's panopticon for the whole society. And interestingly, with the same utilitarian perspectives and Benson. Benson said we need this to optimize the well-being of everyone. And so they also argue like this. Like Benson, they say we are optimizing utility, collective utility, by doing this. And so it's a, it's a very old uh, Anglo-Saxon idea. And this is totally in contradiction with, with the green agenda because, because basically we would need to go globally back to po nuclear power plants. The, the renewable energies cannot at all cope with this type of energy demand because it's a constant demand. While the renewables can only, um, which I sometimes call neotoxic energy, uh, uh, generators, they can, they can only, uh, because you need so many metals to, to, to build them. Uh, and, and, uh, they can only, give you energy, uh, uh, fluctuating energy that doesn't cover 24 seven. And so basically it's totally in contradiction. So at some point there will be, have to be a decision between pursuing this Bantam agenda or pursuing the green agenda. This will be a very, very important point to see what they cherry, uh, cherish more. Right. But I think that the Bantam agenda is ultimately much more important than the re green agenda because, and they have to make a selection because as, as you see in the example of Germany now, you cannot de, um, uh, decarbonize and at the same time build such a, a, a huge energy consuming infrastructure. It's impossible. So it's very interesting, self-contradictory trend. Also like around 1500, by the way. Yeah, I just read the article from BBC over the weekend that I think it was almost 150 years that they've been using coal and they just shut the last remaining coal plants. And I don't know what they're going to do going forward um any other thoughts is there anything new uh lately when it comes to artificial intelligence that's interesting for you yeah so i think that what we are now seeing is that uh you know there was a huge hype when our book got first published the, a month later chat gpt came out and it, in a way drowned out our book i mean our book is still a success but it was drowned out because of this huge success of ChatGPT, where many people said this is a this is the beginning of general artificial intelligence. Now they have created the thinking robot, blah blah blah. Now what we see is very interesting. So so I predicted that this the model these models don't understand what they're doing and they are very limited in their applicability. Also for the for the surveillance state that we were discussing today, but now it is a very interesting new development. The bigger ones are actually declining and have less quality than the generation three. So now, um, so, 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 and this is because for several reasons, but the most important reason is that they are running out of high quality material to train or language material to train the models with. And that also now there's more and more text in the internet, which is created by these models. And it has been shown that if a model is trained with the output of another model, it declines. They, uh, it's, it's, it's very, it's, uh, autophagy, they call it self eating. And so if, if these models eat their own output, they decline. And now we already see that these models, you know, all the things that they do that you don't want, erroneous output, uh, uh, um, uh, but also unwanted output, uh, you cannot prevent it. 
So there's no way. So so now it's it's becoming more and more clear that this whole hype around the uh, large language models and ChatGPT was unwarranted, and that 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 basically and that the scope in which they can be used is also limited. Which is also interesting because many have predicted the end of human labor, like Yuval Harari. That's not going to happen. And and the latest events around this large language model prove that they have been completely overhyped and oversold. And in the end, you know, companies like um, like OpenAI have totally overinvested. And I think their real value is very low. And it's still they're still overvalued because there's still hope that the LLMs will work. But I think like the electric car, the LLMs are overhyped and they will not, uh, it's not a great new trend. So this is maybe the most important finding that what I, my criticism or Barry's and my criticism of, 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 uh, of stochastic AI that we had already in the book, because we had already discussed GPT-3 in the book was correct. And that, that, uh, that these models are not, um, uh, uh, holding up to, to the, to the hopes and expectations that were put into them. Thoughts on transhumanism and any, any, you know, new thoughts on, the transhumanism thing. Um, I, I think we continue to see this idea being pushed by the elites themselves. You know, this idea of Neuralink. Uh, uh, there's a great account on X called Tara Thustra, and it, it picks out clips uh, of all these AIs, transhuman guys. You know, there was one of Sam, Sam Altman recently talking about AI systems, and he was convinced, you know, in five years, no one's going to have to do anything. There's going to be these like touch screens all over the place, like in the movies, and you can just touch it and it'll do everything amazing. And I, I just I do not see that happening at all. And then you Ray Kurzweil coming out. He keeps talking about singularity and, you know, he keeps pushing it back. First, it was supposed to happen next year. And now his next book is like, oh, it's going to happen by 20. I don't know, 45 or something. And and, and any thoughts on uh, the transhumanist yeah. agenda? So so I think that it has driven by several important cultural factors. And I've also written papers about it. And in the book, there's a chapter. But but basically, from the perspective of the of the rich individual, I mean, it was rich 10 billion and more. Right. These rich people, they are they are used to getting everything they want in their lives. They're like spoiled children. And and they and they they are used to being able to buy everything. And so the next step, like for the pharaohs, is immortality. So their personal drive is they want that they are, want this transhumanist agenda because they believe that they can become immortal. So this, I think, at the core, it's a fear of dying. Now I'm a Christian and I'm truly not afraid of dying. I believe that if I make a big effort, I will, I will, when I die, I will be immediately at the Bema to Christu, which is Greek for, um, the judgment chair of Christ. And then Christ will judge me. And I hope that I will be on the right side. I'm doing an effort every day, but they don't believe this. So for them, the only solution is eternal life. And so that's why they personally, I think, because they lack faith, they have to believe in something. And that's why it's a personal drive. But then there's, of course, also many other ideas around transhumanism. It's also big business model. So when when Sam Altman is saying that that everything will be automated and that human beings won't need to be here anymore, he's basically talking about the stock price of open AI, right? So, 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 so the same with Elon Musk. When Elon Musk said we need to regulate AI, it's not because he is afraid that AI will become conscious and rule the world. He doesn't believe this person. It's just because he wants to protect his business model. Because he because he wants to raise the, the the barriers of market entry, he's saying all of this because he wants to raise uh, fear and then get legislation which makes it harder for new companies to enter into the AI domain so that he can have monopolistic profits. So, so Peter Thiel, his friend, has always or ex colleague has always said, um, a "Competition is for idiots." And we want to have monopolies or oligopolies where we can sift off um, much higher profits of society. And this is what this is about. So there's a there's a cultural uh, aspect to this, which you can see in Martin Rothblatt or or also um, Ray Kurzweil, Yuval Harari. But, but that's one pillar, the cultural pillar, which I could elaborate more on, but don't have the time now. There's this real scare of death of the rich people who want to become immortal like the pharaohs did. And then there is also business model behind it. And and all three drive this. And I can tell you when it will burst, when the when the Western financial system will collapse. Right? And like the Dutch tulip system, or in any other hyperinflated debt-driven system, at some point the Western financial system will collapse. 
we don't know when this will happen, but it's that is certain to unlike the singularity, that is certain to happen. And at that point, this whole will be also vanished. So it is totally dependent on the to constant creation of new fiat money and new debt that is fueling it. And once this is this is over, projects like OpenAI, nobody will want to who wants to put his savings into OpenAI? You basically you want to print money and take the printed money to finance OpenAI, but you don't want to put hard-earned money into this. You know, so this is the point. So it's it all depends on this on this on this uh, um, hyperinflated capitalist system, and therefore Russia doesn't have an open AI company, but what Russia has is excellent AI for warfare. And I'm saying this as a citizen who is threatened, you know, potentially from 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 Russia. So I'm saying this with great respect. But they are because they don't have this, you know money system that we have, they actually have to think where they put their money in. So instead of creating castles in the air, you know, um, they they really put their money where their mouth is. And at the moment, that is actually the military. So that's why they are superior to us in terms of AI weaponry. The, the, the point you just made me think of, the point you made about the, the Western financial system collapsing and uh, with that going, the, the hype of AI and all of that. Uh, something I've been thinking about lately is how I feel I, I'm, I'm beginning to believe more and more that the BRICS system will be the world government 3.0. It's going to be the third iteration, you know, League of Nations, UN and BRICS, because now they're talking about BRICS parliament. And I'm seeing commentators online. Um, there was a guy I follow um, recently. I'm trying to pull it up here he made this following uh, Guterres uh, of UN is going to the BRICS summit in uh Kassan and Pepe Escobar says this well I, I'm not sure if he said that exactly yeah. but, yeah, I, but, but I, I, he's one example of this the school right another one is the guy who wrote the book why the west can't win you had him on I think right uh Fadi F Fadi Lami Fadi Lama uh but I can't yeah, find Lama. the book but with this guy that I follow, he's an Indian yeah, analyst, yeah. he's basically said that the UN is becoming more and more useless. And what's going to happen is that BRICS is going to start creating, begin creating this sort of these new international legal norms, almost like, you know, like a, a new form of UN. And, I, I, and that will probably be like the Bretton Woods 3.0 system with a new global, you know, BRICS back world currency. And so well, we'll see how that goes. I, I want to explore that on my own in yeah. the future but um any other thoughts things that we haven't um yeah. touched on brief, that you brief briefly on the brick system so i think um the, a bit of if you look if you look at commentators like fadi lama or, or and and pepe escobar i think they are a bit over optimistic with regard to bricks i mean i mean if you think of of how the the whole us financial system came about it is a very very long tradition which started in venice then, you know, Amsterdam, then the United Kingdom, and then the United States took over the system. So it's a centuries-old financial system that developed very slowly and to a very high degree of maturity and also trust. And, and uh, still a lot of people in Asia trust in the U.S.-based system. They invest into dollar-based assets and so on. So, so I think the change of, 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 of the system, is it takes a long time. And also, we don't know whether BRICS can pull this off. Because a, a lot of how the Western financial system came about is, and this I cannot highlight enough, it's not a matter of planning, but of spontaneous evolution. And I think what 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 uh, many dissidents tend to totally underestimate, and this is maybe the biggest take home message for today's uh, uh, conversation that I want to give to you and the audience, is that spontaneous evolution is the big motor of history. It's not that some people plan something, but what how history works is that things happen spontaneously, and then sometimes gifted ruler like Metternich and Talleyrand in 1815 figure out, oh, this is an opportunity for power. They make the Congress of Vienna and they utilize a spontaneous evolution in, their, in the favor of the interests that they are representing. But it's not vice versa. So history, you cannot sit down and plan history and then do it like you do a physics experiment. 
But history evolves spontaneously and then you can just utilize it and surf on the wave of history as a powerful person. Like Napoleon was surfing on the wave of history for a while. And, and so the same is with the brick system. I don't, I will not never make such a prediction because I don't know what the spontaneous evolution will be and we cannot for, foresee it. But, but, but we, but we must never forget that, that what shapes history is, is a spontaneous process and not a planning. The planning is happening, but most of the time it's failing. Or you can say it's happening in conjunction, yes. and then these spontaneous process, yes. processes will then um, Help dis disrupt plans, and then they'll mm -hmm. have to go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think this is a very good point, because I see a lot of some listeners who are, again, the chatter uh, on the telegrams and the um, X and elsewhere of some listeners that they become very completely to the extreme, disillusioned, where everything's in plan everything's controlled like and i i think no there's like this for there's these variables as you said there there are the the the, elite, the evil elites um the, maybe there are some well-meaning elites well, of as course. well always uh, right and then always. there's the spontaneous spontaneity and then i think you, your perspective and mine is that there's God who's also got a hand in, in history. And whenever he likes, he can snap his fingers and direct the waves to go uh, in another direction. And so I think that that's the formula. And it's not, you know, not every single event is planned by, you know, no. Klaus Schwab. And even if it is, I don't think they can always, they can't always get the plans exactly that they want. No. Let me, well, yeah, of course not. And let me, as regards God, let me wake as a Lutheran, I'd like to make one point. So Catholics, um, for them, God acts direct in history because Catholics have a Hellenistic worldview that is marrying, um, you know, Platonian theology and also Greek view of history with the notion of the Christian God. Luther dismantled this and said, uh, God is only Christianity and theology is only about the relationship of the individual to God. Not about how God acts in history, what he does in society. He says we have to concentrate only on the relationship of ourselves to God. Even, you know, my relationship to God is not of your, of my concern. You should have your relationship to God, which, and, and that's what, what Christ means in Matthew 5, who shall not judge. It means that we, I should not think about what your relationship to God is. But what matters is only my relationship to God matters for the salvation and eternal life of my soul. And, and so, and so I think this is the ultimate reason also why I am quote unquote white pilled. Because I believe no matter what happens, I can always go back to my relationship to God and turn to God personally. And that contains a certain, in a certain way, a solution to, to all the problems. And being faithful means that you are overcome from time to time, if you're lucky, with the feeling that you have this relationship to God. And so this is for me the ultimate, you know, I don't know whether God acts in history. Luther would say we cannot answer the question. We can only answer the question what is our relationship to God and that we should obey God in the way that Christ told us we, sh we should. And, 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 and so this is ju just uh, in parenthesis regarding, regarding um, uh, what, how God goes into the equation. I think God goes into this equation as a, as a, as a personal um, source of strength and resilience in, in, a, in, a, very, in, a, in a situation of great uncertainty. And certainly everybody will agree, even your total mainstream outer party members will agree that, that the saying that we live in a time of very great uh, uncertainty is absolutely true. And, and, and I think the way to cope with this is, is faith. It's interesting you say that. Just this morning, um, I retweeted, re reposted this comment from an account I follow, Marvelous Jesus, which quotes from the Bible, John 16, 33, where it says, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulation mm -hmm. but be of good cheer i have overcome the world and that's sometimes again the criticism i get from list some listeners is that they say i'm black pilled when i just oh. read that like that's i'm like you that, that i'm not i'm it's my white pill mm -hmm. and you yes. know that's why i can stare down the possibility that we will be going towards our doom in the earthly realm you know, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, we, maybe there will be a World War III. Maybe we will end up in a digital ghetto. But that stuff doesn't unnerve me because I have peace, you know. And Jesus says, mm -hmm. do not fear so many times. So I'm not running around with yes. a chicken 
without my head, you know, with my head chopped off, I'm at peace. I do not have yeah. fear. And to have this, as you say, internal um, strength to whatever we're confronted with, that we can confront it with peace. You know, I always imagine scenarios like, what if I'm renditioned by uh, a narc drug cartel or something? And, you know, my, my response is, you know, if I'm in the van with these drug cartels, I'm like, well, I guess it's my time to go. Uh, go ahead, chop off my head, you know, and, and, and that's just... Yes, you just you just face that that it, it is what it is. I I yes. always I often think I, I think of Nick Cave in some ways. Nick Cave's music, uh, yes, yes, has been depressing, but it's comfort comforted to me. And he's got some lines that say that that, that speak to these things like um, everything comes, you know, moves towards its end and 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 that sort of thing. So, and any other thought? Um, yes, jobs well, for, for us. If, if I have a couple of more minutes, yeah. just one more thing: World War Three. So I think that that um, why is why is there a certain proportion of Western elites who want World War III? So it's not the entire Western elite, right? So, for example, I think that Ch Chancellor Scholz of Germany, I don't think he's a great politician. I think he's basically more or less a U.S. vassal. But he, for example, personally doesn't want World War III. Right. So in this in this way, he's a traditional post World War II German because the Germans have had it with World Wars. Right. After two World Wars that they were playing a major role in, they've had it. And it's even this generation to which he belongs, which is a you know he's half a generation older than me. They have had it with World Wars. And and so, but there are others who are absolutely belligerent. Like I believe that, for example, the uh, the neocons in the U.S., which are now represented by a big part of the Democratic Party, like Kamala Harris. Uh, they, they are really belligerent. Why do they want World War III? Why are they insisting on conflict with Russia, with China, with Iran? The three big BRICS powers, you know. Why are they doing this? I think they are doing this because the financial system is so brittle that a war is... Why is a war so attractive? Because in a war, you can convincingly argue that you have to have to, have to spend present or future tax money, which is future as debt, Right. But public debt is future tax uh, income that you have to spend this on private companies for the good of everyone. And that's a perfect recipe that has worked in history so many times until total exhaustion of the population. And I think that they want to save the financial system, which is basically the guarantee of their wealth and their power that that has that they have developed since World War II. All depends on this financial system. If it would chaotically fall apart, a lot of these fortunes would be wiped out. Right. Some of them who own a lot of, you know, real assets would be still persisting, but people like Elon Musk, they would almost lose everything. And so I, because everything he owns is virtual, you know, he has very little real, real property. And, and so I believe that, that they, they want, they are so keen on World War III because it would give them the possibility to prolong the financial system. At least they hope so. And and I think that's why it's so belligerent. It has a lot to do with their fear of a breakdown of the financial system. And so I think World War III is realistic. But but again, one very great source of hope to me is that the West doesn't have the populations that you need to, to lead a big war because you need a, a high surplus of males between 20 and 40. And the West doesn't have the surplus. It has per mother 0.4. Six to 0 0.8 sons, right? And you need three sons per mother or 2.5 sons per mother to have a belligerent society with a lot of, you know, testosterone surplus and, and also young men who don't know what to do in their lives. And then you can have, so therefore, I think that they have not taken into account this very important variable. So there is a strong drive for World War III from a part of the Western elite based on their fear of the collapse of the financial system and the hope that they can stabilize it. But on the other hand, other very important um, preconditions to successfully wage such a big war are missing. So don't fear the algorithm ghetto. Don't fear a third world war. Um, <laughs> anything else? <laughs> no, I think, I think, you know, it's, Fear is important to be to be careful. And the reason why I went through the COVID times in a perfect way for my family was that I was afraid of certain things in the right way. So fear is a very, and the same for you, right? You were afraid and this raised your instinct and skepticism. And then you took some very good decisions, I think. And, and I think that, that so fear is, if, if fear is restricted, 
it is a, it is it's like when you are I was just climbing in the mountains of Cortina at 3000 meters of altitude and when you are climbing at this altitude and you you have to be afraid so that you are careful when you're climbing if you are careless you drop down and you're dead and so I think a good dose of fear that is absolutely important so I I think we should not be fearless we should have the right amount of fear but as you said we should also be rational and 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 con contain the fear and what I was trying to do in this hour with you is give some arguments why why it's important to fear one should also contain it so every once in a while we, we bring in your to uh calm us down it's like a therapy um <laughs> a pill when is your second edition of the book going to be published do you know so i think i have to bury and i have to hand in the manuscript end of this month and then it will take a couple of months so in february or march it should it should probably be um should probably be published and maybe then if enough happens that we have new ideas to discuss we can then talk again but it doesn't have to be linked to the book Yeah, I'm, again, I, I highly recommend the book. I first learned about you. Um, you did a great chat on UK Column um, yeah. a long while back. Um, and then Alex Alex Thompson. Thompson, he's, he's, I should get him back on yes, at some point should. as well. It's been quite a while. And so uh, is there any other, besides getting your, your book, is there any, any website um, or other project that we should know about or, or where people can find you? I, I mean, I'm, as a scholar, I'm on Google Scholar. Right. And if you're interested in my writings, you can go there. But I'm not very active on social media because because I'm not an activist. You know, um, I'm I'm uh, you are there are, you know, the various categories. You are a chronicler and thinker. And then there are other people who are more activist, like, you know, Whitney Webb. She's more activist type. And then there are there are people like me who are more observers and 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 do analysis and so that's that's why I don't have such a strong social media pre, uh, presence. But but on Google Scholar you can find and follow my my academic work. All right, I'll I'll link those in the description. And uh, you know, thanks. Keep up the great work, Jobs. Don't fall down uh, any mountains. No, thanks for the invitation. Talk to you soon again. Bye bye.